Hi friends, this episode of Big Blue Banter is brought to you by Prize Picks. Head on over to Prize Picks and use promo code BANTER and they'll match up to $100 on a new deposit. Thank you and enjoy. Welcome back. It's the Big Blue Banter, New York Giants football podcast. I'm Dan Schneier. Joined as always my co-host Nick Filato. Today we've got our favorite guest on the show, a reoccurring guest who, by the way, if I had to go back and tally it, I don't know if this is a scientific type of deal, but I would say our most downloaded, our most listened to, and our most praised podcast are when we have this guest on. So we're happy he gives us the time whenever he gives us the time, and he's given us the time, the best time of year, the draft time, when he's at his finest, and that's David Cyberston of Our Lads. David, how you doing, Dave? I just call you Cy. I never call you Dave or David. Call so me Cy. Back yeah. call you, Cy. Yeah. you know what? I'm more comfortable when you call me Cy. That's what my, what my hometown go. friends call me. So Exactly. And that's how I first came into you. I came into knowing you on BBI from, mm. from all the work you do over there, and this is when I was like, 14 years old following the Giants. So yeah. we're so glad to have you back on. The first thing I want to ask you is, how are you doing during this draft season? I know it's a grind. <laughs> so are you, are you still with us here? Progress from last year, meaning I don't have pink eye this time around. So uh, <laughs> things are better. It's, uh, yeah, we just got done talking about how how much of a grind it is. And you don't even, you, you don't even realize how much of a grind it is until you start to physically break down a little bit. <laughs> you realize yeah. it's a few workouts here and there. You're you're eating cheese its at 2 a.m. saying oh, nothing's wrong with this. What <laughs> but um no, it's it's I'm doing well. Um definitely honored to come on with you guys and talk ball. Um I think you guys are two of the best that do it. And as long as you guys keep your foot on the gas, I think uh you're gonna take it as far as you want to. And that's why I truly do like coming on and and talking with you guys and discussing what we agree with, what we don't agree with, and the whys and the why nots. Uh it's just it's good quality conversation. That's why. I'll, I'll always come on with you as long as you'll have me, you know, nice. um, it, it's, it's a great time and I'm really honored to be back with you. Really Sai, man. That. Thank you so much. That was such a kind words. And before we get into the draft, which is right around the corner, mm-hmm. let's get a, let's get a little bit of David Syverson's thoughts on the New York giants off season so far, a little yeah. bit different, right? I want to get uh, your thoughts on it and how that sets up the NFL draft. I feel like the offseason, other than the the typical misery that the Giants fans have been under over the past you know decade, with that you know with a couple of little playoff games runs here and there, it's been a really tough ride, right, for a long time. And it's hard to get optimistic now because we've been optimistic so many times, and just to be let down, whether it's by quarterbacks, by injuries, by various coaching changes, new GMs, uh, but same old result. Uh, but if you take any sort of recency bias out of it, I think this offseason has been as productive as you would want it to be. Minus the one question, what are we doing at quarterback? And the offseason is not over yet. We don't know. So it's still incomplete, obviously, as it is across the league. But leading up to this big decision that we're about to find out the final result to in about 10 days, it's almost as good as you could have imagined because they the money they have given out has not been irresponsible. They didn't overpay anyone. Um, they got a premier pass rusher. I remember following the season, I'm um, looking at this situation, and I got some kickbacks, some heat for should or should they not go after quarterback. And I think they should, but I don't think they're going to. You know, and I'm, I'm sure we've beaten that subject to death. And what I do would want them to do if they don't go quarterback is build an identity on this roster. And this is pre Brian Burns trade. And I said, Hey, you guys, we have, the giants need to find something to build into their current nucleus that is going to scare the opposition. And whether it's explosive plays an efficient passing game, a dominant offensive line. And I said, the pieces that can be there, that might be there. You just need one more is the pass rush and giants fans. You guys all know that can be the foundation of a team. You need clutch play. You need efficient play on offense. We know that. You need to figure out what's going on at quarterback. We know that. But that trade for Brian Burns kind of put this offseason into, okay, there really is a plan here, and they have pieces. If Dexter Lawrence continues to be Dex, if Kayvon hits his ceiling, which we started to get a glimpse of last year, and Brian Burns continues to be Brian Burns, that one, two, three punches, you could put that up with one of the you know top five to top seven pass rushes in the NFL, and that's a great identity to have in today's NFL. I think that's a great point, and I I don't want to count it just yet because of the history of of him and you know the injuries. But yep. I think if the ceiling, if everything clicks, I think Aziz Ojolari could be a really good fit for, for what Shane Bowen wants to do. 
from a schematic yep. standpoint. So I just want to throw that in there too. I know everybody's moved on, but just keep that in mind. He doesn't have to be on the field every snap. He could be exactly what they need behind those mm-hmm. victories. So Absolutely. I love that. I want to ask you a little bit of question, a few more on the Giants, and we'll get and this one could tie into the draft, actually. Offensive line wise. I want to get your thoughts on what they did this offseason and how that sets them up for the draft when it comes to taking potentially taking a tackle at six. And then I want to know how that affects you, or your mindset when potentially taking either a tackle or a guard at 47 or 70. Yeah. Um, it, I don't think O-line is going to be early. I don't think it's going to be an option at six because of the signings. If they didn't sign Runyon and, uh, and Jermaine to, from Las Vegas – I think it would be a bigger discussion. Um, I was just a part of a mock draft last night. I didn't get to control the pick, but it was with someone else. And he picked Joe Alt at six overall. He was there. And you're not going to get any fight from me. I am O-line all day. I think okay. that's uh, – it needs to – unless – until it's very good, you need to keep adding. And, um, you know, there are improvements that have been made, and I like the guys that they have in there. But I don't think it's going to be an option at six because of what they did in free agency and because of just two years ago they spent that, that – uh, seventh row overall on Evan Neal. And to me, this front office is very, Hey, we made a plan three years ago. We're sticking to the plan. This is, this is just a part of the plan. Yes. We hit a roadblock. We were ravaged by injuries last year. We lost Andrew Thomas and it just changed everything about this team. Um, Daniel Jones played six games and got hurt, you know, neck injury, knee injury. Um, I think they're going to run it back with this offensive line with these two new additions. And don't forget, you know, Aaron Stinney's a nice solid piece. Well, uh, to, to be a backup, Austin Schlotman, I think what they did is they they went they made this draft class sorry they made this offensive line via free agency something they don't have to add to early on, and Evan Neal still he holds the keys to the bus and I know not everyone wants to hear that um, and this is coming from someone I had a really high grade on Evan Neal I right. still <laughs> I went back and watched Alabama tape from college uh, when he was in college and I'm trying to figure out like what did I not see here. Yeah. I mean, I had a report on him that he had a hard time staying on his feet, and that is a red flag uh, to an offensive lineman. If you can't stay on your feet, that there are going to be issues that carry over to the NFL. But it was not enough for me to not place a really high first-round grade on him. And I'm watching his tape here. It just looks different. He looks like a different dude. And, you know, I don't want to get too into sports psychology, but that's where I go towards. Like, he just lost his confidence. He lost his mojo. Can he get it back? by being moved inside, can he get it back with the new offensive line coach? You know, step one is, is the latter option, new offensive line coach. Can you get something different out of them? And then plan B is going to be move them inside. And that's the, that's where the value of the signing of Jermaine is. There, there's a hedge there. You know, he, he can be a right tackle, a serviceable right tackle, better than what the Evan Neal has been bringing to the table. So yeah. I do believe offensive line needs to be addressed with one of these first three picks um, it's hard to go into a draft saying, hey, we'll find one in round three. It's possible, uh, especially a tackle or guard. Um, but I wouldn't force it because, say this every year with you guys, there's a lot of holes on this roster. Yeah. So staying with the New York Giants' current roster, they're completely changing the way they're going to run the football in the sense that there is no more Saquon Barkley. Saquon Barkley is now in Philadelphia. Now you have Devin Singletary, Eric Gray, Gary Brightwell. Do you think Joe Shane prioritizes running back at all in this draft, or do you think it might be a UDFA day three type of pick? What, what What's your opinion on the running back situation heading into the draft? I believe part of the Saquon Barkley conversation and decision that they made as a front office was somewhat dictated by this upcoming draft class. Meaning, no, we're not going to go find Saquon Barkley, but I do think we can find his production via Devin Singletary and someone else that we can get in this draft. And I bring up this draft class because, yeah, you have a couple guys that I think have standout grades, just two or three. But my third through eighth graded running back, with my the way I score running backs and how I grade them, had the same exact grade. So you might see a running back stack for me and like, wow, Jalen Wright is eighth. And Blake Corm is third. No, they have the same grade. And so does everyone in that class. And from what I can gather from names that I've talked to, both in and out of the league, the running back stack is deep. There's not very top heavy. It's not like you don't have B. John Robinson or Jameer Gibbs coming out of this class. But you're going to have guys that fall into rounds three, four, maybe even five. that mm-hmm. are very similar to the talents that you have getting drafted in round three. So it just takes away some urgency, but it also can ensure that you're going to get a running back out of this group that can replace at least one of the roles that Saquon Barkley produced. Bring in Singletary, that tells me they're going to go after more of like a power type back that can get some stuff done between the tackles. Estimate, I love- maybe? 
I love Estime. Yo, and talk t- about it. Do you like him? Oh, yeah, dude. We're yeah, both see you nodding your head pretty hard yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I like about Estime is, you know, we, we get caught up with running with, with 40 times all the time. We always say, yep. don't do it at running back. Don't do it. He goes out and runs a 4-7. And I have some people hitting up my phone that people I respect are like, oh, that's it. Round six, round seven. I'm like, no shot. There's two things about that. Um that I was, I was, I was confused by the forty time. A, his ten yard split matched everyone that ran in the four fives. Right. There's, there, there's plenty of tape on him running away from defensive backs in space. Like not just a player too. Like it, it's all over his tape. Um, and then he went back to his senior bowl and he ran a four six. So that, that to me isn't the issue. But you're, dra- you're drafting estimate because of what he can do after contact. What he can do to just, you know, drive defenders backwards, displace guys that are trying to tackle him. Um, better footwork than you would think for a big guy like that. Um, I would even say a shortcoming of Saquon Barkley's game has always been like that tough third and one goal line, carry break tackles. You know, I, I hate to say, call a grown man uh, lack or say a grown man lacks toughness that could, you know, wrap me into a pretzel and, and throw me yeah. down the street if you wanted to. But that was one thing about Saquon's game that I felt like he lacked, lacked some of that grit. And you get a running back like Estime in there. You know at very least he's going to provide that, that Saquon didn't. So this is the money ball approach, right? You lose Jason Giambi off the A's. You're not going to get Jason Giambi, but you're going to try to replace the production that he, you know, pieced together through different players. And that might, honestly, in today's NFL, that does seem to be the best way to build a backfield. Yeah, and we were talking about Audric Estime, the running back of Notre Dame. I know people have commented, and it is a good thing to always kind of bring back up the names and the schools. And we're going to get into specific players at some point, but I do want to talk more 30,000-foot view stuff with you first. Yeah. So I want to, we'll want we circle back to running backs and O-line for sure because we're going to get there and we're going to need to hear about that. Um, but I want to say one thing about what you just mentioned on running back before I ask a different question, which is, you know, I love what you said about kind of like the money ball approach to this, which, and I think ultimately you're on the same page as a side, but would you agree that the best way to build a running game is really through the offensive line? Yeah. And this is coming from someone that wanted Saquon Barkley in 2018. I'll go on record saying I was, I was one of those guys. Didn't want Darnold. Didn't want Bradley Chubb. Quentin Nelson would have been a nice consolation. Um, but I, I loved, I loved the, the fantasy of Saquon Barkley. And that was as Eli Manning's career was coming down to an end. And I just envisioned it being something that could really elevate Eli for another few years. And I was wrong. It shouldn't have been the pick back then. And I have changed my, my approach to running back position as has the league with, with just economic spending resource spending, you really can go up and down the league and and not have to use a premium pick with that said, I think eight of the nine top rushers in the NFL last year were first, second, or third round picks. And I I do think you need to find talent there and waiting till day three, you know, you're not always going to find Raheem Mostert back there, you know, or Elijah Mitchell for that one year, he started to flash. It's, you still need a talented guy back there, but to answer your question, you don't go there until you build the offensive line. It has to be offensive line first. And if it's not, it's just not the way the game works. So right. unless you really have your six, seven deep on the offensive line, that always has to take priority over running back. If you look at the Falcons and the Lions, they both took running backs high last year in the first round. And it's kind of yep. like, oh, is the pendulum swinging back that way? Perhaps. But at the same time, they also have foundational pieces on both of their offensive lines. Great. Those point. guys have been building the offensive line for years. For years. And, and and they they've been hitting doubles and triples with, with day three picks. Correct. So, you know, when's, when's the last time the Giants have done that? You know, you, you do. I hate to see, I don't want to use the term luck. That's part of what this is, but you know, you, you are going to have to go the Eagles route and just put first round and second round picks for a decade <laughs> to, to really, to find that the true, the, the answer at offensive line, are you going to have to find those doubles and triples, you know, guys, when I say that, I mean, guys that far outplay their, their perceived uh, projection draft weekend, like you get a fourth, fifth rounder that can really get it done and you look around the league. It's tough to find them on day three. It really is. Even with the Eagles, too, they got lucky with Kelsey. I want to say that was the same year they drafted Danny Watkins. Philadelphia drafted. It was like an older fireman who was like a guard. I think it was an ex-fireman. And it just did not work out at all. But that same draft, they draft Kelsey, Jason Kelsey, on day three. And it looked out for them. And somehow they're able to locate Jordan Maialata. I know. (laughs) Incredible job right there. And they have one of the best offensive line coaches in the NFL, which I think everybody recognizes, Jeff Allen. It's something that you have to as well but i think a couple more things on that that i just want to say uh, that i that i missed earlier aldrich estimate i think 
I'm like, we all love you. It's clear. We all love him, but I think he's a value because people are looking at that 40 time, but what they're not recognizing is that it doesn't really take, it doesn't really describe his whole profile. You talked about the 10 yard split, but he's also a really explosive athlete. Yeah. He had a 38 inch vertical and a 10, yeah. five broad. And yeah. it's five, five, 11, two twenty one. Like that's my ideal build for running. Yep. I don't want you over six foot, but I also want you in that two twenty range. So because he's someone we'll talk about more late, a little bit later, but I want to transition a bit to the cornerback position. This is the most interesting one for me. Now, if it was still Wink Martindale running the defense, I'm pretty sure this would be another top priority for the Giants. Wink Martindale's gone on record saying my most important position is the corner. I'm not so sure that's the case with Shane Bowen. Yet the Giants depth chart suggests it's a massive need. Mm-hmm. I had issues with corner side because from my this is more 30,000 foot view from my perspective, it's one of, if not the toughest positions to hit on in the NFL, because it's just so hard to play it at the NFL yep. level. You're back. You, just how it works. You're backpedaling and they're coming at you. It's a real, you're at a disadvantage every single snap. So I think we see a lot of busts in the late one, early two range. And these are guys that going into the process, we're all like, yeah, he's got this and this and this. We like him. It's a value pick. And they end up seeing in there and they just don't really make it in the NFL. In this class at f- around pick 47, are there any guys that stand out to you as could be, should be great values that the Giants should be looking to target there. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you said there. Really tough position to project, hit on. It's my, it's always been my most difficult position to scout. Uh, and part of it is just the, the time it takes to, to really scout a cornerback is almost as much as a quarterback because mm-hmm. you can watch 20, 30 minutes of film and get one or two plays that really can give you something of substance to add to the scouting report. You know, they can get not they can not get thrown to. Uh, no one can run their way. True. The routes, they're not off the line. It's just, it's a really tough spot. And then, like you said, what scheme are they being put into? What are they asked to do in the NFL? It might be completely different. I mean, Kenyon Mitchell is my number one corner, but he was rarely up in press coverage in college. Like, that's right. that's a big deal to me. That's, that's a question that you're going to have to roll the dice on. Uh, but to answer the question about that second-round pick, You know, I think one of the first questions I'd rather ask you back is, are you looking for a nickel or are you looking for an outside guy? Because I think they need both. The personnel tells me right now they probably could get by at nickel and you could find a safety nickel. But what do you think they need more? Uh, Do you think they need someone inside or on the outside? It's a great question. It's one that was asked of us in our mailbag episode last last podcast. I think the way me and Nick answered it was, you know, we're just going to take the best corner available. We, we're not worried too much about that. We just need a corner. Yeah. I will say this, though. I oddly feel a little bit more confident on the outside. This is just a player that Nick and I have loved on tape. He's been it's been over a very small sample size. So we don't want to get too excited, but I oddly feel a little bit more confident with Nick McLeod on the outside. Yeah. I feel like, I like somehow some way it's just had good tape with the Giants. He doesn't get a lot of snaps with Wink, but he had good tape. And then in the and on the verse verse on the vice versa, on the inside i'm projecting maybe flat there but i don't know if i feel that confident with that right now he just needs to be stronger you can't right. have a like, nickel who can't play the run exactly. that's I mean, exactly that how i feel about it a, a player i love in this class is cooper de and i think ultimately the nfl won't overcorrect on it and he will be a first round pick but i think it's possible that he falls just because he has that tweener label and people might be like oh i don't know if i can trust him on the outside but if you put him on the inside as your nickel i think he does everything i want like he could play the run he attacks downhill as a blitz like he just looks like a playmaker to me so i yeah. guess for me the answer would be if i could because there are sometimes those guys that fall that range i, m- I remember a guy i loved either two or three draft classes ago jalen petrie from baylor yeah. like yeah. At, he if he like i think he can fall to that round two range if somebody like that's available i prioritize that over an outside corner personally yeah i would too i think there's more you can do with them um and even on to build off the gene he's also a returner and return game is going to be a bigger part of the game now with with the new rules so that does like i did i boosted a couple got you know i I, this helped me break a few ties uh when you're combining positions together for an actual big board is that they added value to the return game because it's different now um so if you want someone inside my number one corner that i would target in round two is and the re- one of the reasons why I asked you was that I think this guy can do both. So kind of, okay. kind of again, get the best player and figure it out is Max Melton from Rutgers. I knew you were going to say that, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We've been talking about Max Melton yeah. for a while on the podcast. Good. Just, just a freak athlete. Like when I, he was the first, first player I wrote an evaluation on, Cy. And nice. I was like, bro, is everybody in this draft class like this? Because like his click and close when he when he sees yep. it, because he has really yep. good zone eyes. When he sees it, he's immediate right at the catch point, really harassing, just has a lot of refinement that needs to kind of be ironed out. But please talk about Max Melton. 
for multiple years, he's done that. Uh, like the click and close line, I, you, you, uh, you've always liked to like, that's what you've always looked for. And I think in a lot of situations, you've been right about corners for that reason. And that's something, I mean, it's hard to project guys to the college or the NFL. It just is, you know, you're, you're doing your best to make an educated guess. And that's something that carries over to the next level. Like that's something you have to you almost have to have if you're going to be considered a top 45 pick. And I think Milton's going to, Milton's going to wind up in my top 40 overall, and do I think he falls down there? It's tough. I mean, this cornerback group, after like the top three, four guys, it's it's like almost like the running backs. It's just a mixed match of 10 guys that have very similar grades, but very similar different skill sets. Um, I think the, the, the length and the height has gotten a little overblown. It's almost like some teams are just going overkill on that. And they're, they're just overlooking these really quality corners, like a Max Mountain type. I mean, yep. he's not small, but he's not one of the bigger guys in this class. Really physical dude really instinctive. He's got receiver caliber ball skills. And I think the giants have to continue and try to find ways to change the game via turnovers. And who knows what the new defensive scheme, they, they seem more safe than aggressive, uh, which is a complete antonym of, of what we've watched Wink Martindale do. Uh, I'm excited for it. Um, Wink, Wink really, I got excited about him and I quickly, you know, towards the tail end of last year, it was just a little too Jekyll and Hyde for me. Um, where I would like to have a little bit more security and we know what we're getting week in, week out, but you need the right personnel for that. And I think that's part of the reason why Wink played the way he did. Uh, but Max Mount to me is a guy that just athletically is ready for the NFL day one. The instincts show up on play uh, on tape, as do the the ball skills to the point where I think he could be a big time playmaker at the next level. And part of the reason why I do like him for the Giants more so than other teams is he can play inside out because I don't think they know what they're doing at corner yet. And you get a guy in here let him play and just see where he's more comfortable. Then you can almost build around him a little bit. The 30,000 foot viewpoint, which is, I do kind of agree with you that NFL teams, you can find these like quote unquote outliers that end up being massive values because they're like, and some NFL teams like, if you don't have this arm length, that corner, you're not on my board. You can't fit my system. You can't play for me. But you know, sometimes you over, like there's been guys like Asante Samuel. I watched him on tape and I was like, how the hell is this dude? Not a first round pick. He falls to round two and he's one of the best corners immediately in the NFL. I felt very similar click and close wide to Mac uh, about Max Melton to DJ Turner from last year's draft class. And I feel like from what I've seen, he's done pretty well transitioning to the Bengals there. So I, I just, I'd rather look for those kind of traits than being like, Oh, do you have the arm length or do you have like the prototypical at that position specifically for corner too? Because it's like, I, I get why the teams have that and why maybe for their system, they need that, but I'm not so sure that I would prioritize. So I'm glad you brought that up. Now, Nick, you can go ahead with, with uh, more questions on corners. Yes. Yeah, so I just uh, give us some other names that, that fit the 47 70 range and fit what the giants are looking for. Cause giants are going to be looking for these two read guys, guys who play like yep. match principles, but it's essentially just man coverage, but you have yep. to have some sort of football IQ to understand what the, what the offense is running at you. I do. I agree that they're going to have to have some sort of intelligence decision making and just to build off in, build into those names and build off what you guys just said. The if someone's greatest trait is their size, right? And even in some cases, speed. I'm wondering if they don't have the feel for the game. And the, the, to me, the NFL is becoming more about these short dump off passes. Get the ball out quick. Get the ball out quick. If you don't have the feel, I, I actually want – I would rather have someone smaller and quicker and faster reaction because, you know, those guys have an easier time making plays on the ball uh, on these short to intermediate routes. And there's nothing worse than having a good defense, but the pass rush can't get there because they're getting rid of the ball. And they're getting rid of the ball because the corners can't make decisions quick enough or physically react quick enough. And those guys that you just named, uh, the best ball reactor is Andrew Phillips from Kentucky. Again, undersized. Um, he was a guy that I wasn't even paying attention to in the fall. And I was watching film on Florida, I believe. It was Florida-Kentucky game, the game that Ray Davis went off on. And he's he immediately just jumped off the screen to me. And I didn't know who he was at the time. And that's some one of my favorite parts about scouting sometimes is, like, you're not looking for a guy, but the guy finds you, you know. <laughs> and it. just the way he moves, um, his backpedal, his transitions, um, his ability to get his hands on the ball without committing penalties – um, again, not a very big guy, so I think it's going to hurt. I mean, it did. It hurt his grade a little bit, but I still have day two there. Um, round two is definitely where I think he's going to start becoming a discussion. Um, I have him as my number 12 corner, and there are that many guys um, in the in the top two rounds of this class uh, that, you know, it, it, 
I, I like a couple of other guys more. There's one name that I like more than others, two of them actually, uh, Chris Abrams Drain from Missouri, who I actually have him above Rake Straw because, of, again, exactly what we just said, the feel, uh, the instincts, the intelligence, former quarterback, um, has experience on both sides of the ball. And a name that I had in my preseason 32 um, – and he just he was never there in the public spotlight, but he had a great workout. I thought he had a really good season. Is Nehemiah Pritchett from Auburn? Mm -hmm. um, now a lot of guys have DJ James, the, his teammate from Auburn, but the size is off the charts bad with him. Pritchett ran a sub four four, really good ball skills. I thought you know some of the tape that this one thing I look for again with limited time can't watch every tape from every single player unless we're talking quarterback. How do these guys perform against their best competition? And then the SEC, you know, you don't need to look far to, to find that film. And I thought Pritchett played really well against his best competition. I love it. So I want to ask you about one specific player who I, I like a lot in this draft class and who somebody I've started to look into and, and think could be a potential good fit for the Giants. And I don't exactly know how to pronounce his name, but it's Mike Sainristall, the corner out of, out of Michigan. So I just look at this profile. I just really like, I know he's also undersized and I was just looking it up. He's even shorter than he was projected to be. I think he was just five, nine, a little like five, nine and a half, one eighty two. So maybe it is more in the mold of what we discussed before, like the, the future nickel, but former receiver. And I feel like you could see those ball skills at the catch point. I think he's physical. He's obviously not big, but I think he's really physical at the, at the catch point as well. And coming from that system to a Michigan, I know he's a little advanced age too. He's, he's almost 24. So there's some red flags from that standpoint, maybe projection wise, uh, as far as just what teams look for younger guys, bigger, but man, I watch him play and I'm like coming from that Michigan system. I could totally see him as an awesome fit for the giants in their new system. Absolutely. I didn't bring him up earlier because I think he might be, you know, I, 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 he might be gone by the time okay. they're around pick. And I even, I, I get asked or I create a list uh, for our lads, five guys are going to be surprised first rounders, you know, and not projecting them to the first round, not grading them either, but just guys that based on Who are those guys, by the way, I want you to give us those guys. Maybe we'll see. Okay, no, 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 no don't, that's not out yet. Oh, oh don't, yeah, it's not out yet. Yeah, oh, no, 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 no. don't give us anything. I'll, yeah, I'll give you yet. one of them. And it's okay. Mike Sammer still. I'll there give you go. another one too once we get to that position because I want to okay. get your feedback on it. Don't but give us one of those guys. I think he might be a first round pick. Okay. Um, not because Even at five nine one eighty two after the combine. Yeah, okay. and it's 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 the league loves him. I mean, he's been. Terry on Arnold has gotten great feedback as well in this regard. And he didn't have the greatest workout either. He might be a top 10 pick that kid he ran a four five. Right. Um, and ran even slower at his pro day, by the way. Um, but Sam was still the fact that he's been playing corner for just a couple of years and all of a sudden becomes an all American corner. Right. And that plays inside and outside. He was slot only. And then they moved him outside. They gave him some outside looks this year. He's awesome. Um, my, my issue with him is obviously there is going to be some physical limitation with him on an island against vertical threats. Uh, but again, you talk about IQ, which is a great fit for this scheme. He can make up for some of that and he's quick as lightning. So I think he's, he's like a, he's one of those running backs that finds his top speed in a real, in a hurry, which can hide some of the downfield speed issues and he knows what's coming. So it, it's almost, it's hard to beat a guy that really understands the game at a high level and San Rosil, the, the run defense, he is aggressive, but he is awful at taking proper yeah. angles from that nickel position. I actually graded him as a liability against the run. He's physical and some corners, you know, they couldn't stop a nosebleed. Like they, they, they don't want to be touched. You know, they say, Hey, you 10 guys, you go tackle them. I'm going to cover this dude. He's not that guy, but his run defense grade was, was a little rough for him. So those are two issues, lack of length, lack of size, and just poor angles, which could come from the lack of experience. And that's something that maybe could get better at the NFL, but it's tough to get better once you're in the NFL at, at something like that once the league gets faster. So, I mean, yeah, I am all over that dude round two if he's there. And that's Mike Sainristall, the corner out of Michigan. Yeah. I love the fact that you brought up his eyes. He read this, um, the sale concept from the deep half of a cover two to undercut a seven route versus watched in the national championship, took yep. it to the house. I believe that was at the end of the fourth quarter, had another mm -hmm. one where he was reading like two to three against Indiana. And uh, I think that was on a third and 12 and he, just undercut it, intercepted it. So, but I, I actually had some issues with him. I think in um like on deep routes, on nine routes, I had a couple down in my notes from Bowling Green, Maryland, and Minnesota, where he was uh kind of getting burnt 
I'm hoping that's an angle thing as well, because the athletic ability and the fluidity and all of that is there. But that's certainly an option if he were to fall. But again, I'm not optimistic that he's going to fall. Sai, for the safety position, we've heard a lot about Shane Bowen running these three safety sets. I think some of the cornerbacks kind of bleed in with the safety a little bit, like the Renardo Greens of the world from Florida State. People think, oh, man, he might be more of a safety. Can you discuss what safeties in this draft class you appreciate on day two for the New York Giants? And who do you think would fit well with the Shane Bowen system? J uh, Javon Bullard from Georgia okay. is a guy that I like a lot. Really twitchy, aggressive, fast, undersized again. You know, that's a theme of a lot of defensive guys that I like in this class, unfortunately. Uh, just don't have the NFL size. But, you know, you're a big part of the Georgia defense for multiple years. That that means something to me. If it doesn't matter there, I can't imagine it matching that, mattering that much at the next level. Uh, Cole Bishop from Utah is just a, a great center fielder type. Ran faster than we all thought. Um, I thought that he was the best pure. I was at the senior bowl this year. So I got to watch the practice from different angles and, you know, from the end zone from up top. And I thought he was the best mover there. Uh, just, just fluid, explosive, great feel, always going in the right direction. Um, a name that I just wrote up the other day, um, on a second look was, was, T uh, Dadrian Taylor Demers from Texas tech. That dude, his, his tape is standout. And yes. I think he, he's a weapon. He's a missile coming from the top end, but he's also, he's fast enough to play in deep coverage. So those are three names that are all day two guys to me that, you know, round two might be a little rich and it's hard. It's a hard sell for me with all the other holes on the team. And the fact that there are going to be players available at those holes that they would use a second on a safety, but round three, I think it's on, I think it's possible. Um, but those are, those are three names that I really like in that area. And then, you know, if I had my preference, if I had to like create my perfect Giants draft, I probably would wait till day three, round four, round five mm. for some of these guys. And, you know, Malik Mustafa from Wake Forest is just a fun dude. You know, he's really physical, comes from, jumped out of the building as, as, uh, as pro day. Um, Jaden Hicks, probably more of a third, second or third round pick. So we probably shouldn't talk about him um, in this regard. Uh, Josh Proctor is a safe kind of just, Hey, I'm going to be at the right place at the right time. He's really long. He's been at Ohio state for a long time, pretty productive. You know, maybe not that he's a kind of like a leggy mover, meaning hard for him to change direction. Not the most agile guy, but you know, if you're talking day three safeties, you're not finding a, a year one starter. You're finding a guy. Can you find a role player at, at that point to combine with Jalen Mills, Jason Pinnock, you know, Dane Belton and Gervais, Gervais Owens have the opportunity of a lifetime this year yeah. in the three, yeah. season, three safety looks that, right. you know, part of me thinks that if you enter day three, you haven't picked the safety yet, you roll with those guys because you're not going to get much of an upgrade over what those guys bring to the table. So it, it's a tough call there if you don't go early with safety. All right, Cy, real quick on just the safety position, judging by everybody that you just went through, Pinnock, Dane Belton, Javarius Owens, if you had to add a certain archetype to the safety room, either early day three or late day two, what type of safety do you think would best complement Shane Bowen's system? Great question. Great question. I would love to see a center field type, a guy okay. with a little bit more range, can get to the sidelines from, from a, a cover two, cover three type, um, a guy that I just feel safe about being in deep coverage and being the last line of defense. Um, I'm such, I'm such a sucker for, for big plays, <laughs> you know, like I, I want a guy out there. Like when they had Kevin Bayard from, from Tennessee before they traded him last year, all pro a couple times, like it was all, it wasn't the best safety in the world, but he, he made game changing plays on a routine basis. And I would love the giants to get a guy that, you know, it's hard to predict turnovers on a player to player basis, but the skill set of a guy that can, you know, cover a lot of ground and take proper angles to the deep ball on a team that you're right now, you're a little vulnerable at, at least one of the cornerback spots. So, you know, teams are going to be taking shots at you downfield. That's the kind of guy that I would want on the field, uh, even more so than a nickel type or, or a run stuffer is get someone that has a little bit more range that can make plays uh, in deep coverage. Yeah. It's interesting when we talk safety side, because it's another one of those positions like corner for me that I have a really difficult time evaluating. I feel really confident and good about those near the box type guys like Brian branch, Digi, like players I know can, can do a lot of things, but then you get to like guys like Ashton Davis, a guy I love that a Cal I'm watching him on am like, this dude is a center fielder immediately in the NFL and yep. he just hasn't hit. And I think right. the size is a factor for some of those guys. But I want to ask about one safety who had a ton of hype after the 2022 season came back, didn't have a strong 2023 and then just totally bomb the combine. And I want to see your evaluation of him. If maybe that means there's value for the giants to be had, if he just keeps sliding on the draft board and it's Cameron Kitchens, the, the yeah. safety out of Miami, what are your thoughts on him? 
you know, over the summer, um, I had him as a future first round pick. You know, I was asked to make a top 32. So like, hey, who do you, who do you think is going to be a first round pick in August? You're like, geez, come on. Like I haven't even yeah, gotten a quarter of the way through tape, but you do your best. And it's just, right. you know, it's again, just to cre create some conversation. Kitchens was, I think I finished in like 24 overall. He's in the 20 somewhere. And it was because of like what he did on tape, huge mm -hmm. playmaker. And that's exactly what I was just talking about. Right. Like that's what I want. And what I liked about him is I got Ed Reed vibes as I was watching him play. You know, someone always going the right direction. Then I listened to a lot of his interviews and listened to him talk. And what are his processes like? Like, he sounds like a pro. He's very smart, well-respected. I'm like checking all these boxes. And I talked to Dane Brugler during the fall. And he's like, he's not going to run well. And I was like, what are you talking about? He's not going to run well. And then you start to see some things on tape when he really has to turn and run. When he has like an uh-oh moment. When he's got a, oh, shoot, I, I made the wrong read. The guy's running downfield. He can't catch up. And that in college. That's 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 a no go. And then yes, he completely bombed the workout. Um, he was if you guys remember that Miami loss at home against Georgia Tech where they screwed up the uh, they were yeah. Of oh, wow. God, that was the worst that, coach game I've maybe ever seen. It was, and that coach deserved ninety nine percent of the blame, but the other one percent was Cam oh, Kitchens. Yeah, you're right. Coverage, you know, that, there was no point in doing what he did. True. Um, he he went. A lot of these kids they want to go for the big play. It's almost like they care about that more than the more than winning the game. I don't know, Cam. I shouldn't say that about him, but it, it's it's a generational thing where it's a highlight world uh, that we live in. And he went for that big yeah. play, even though there was no point. Let someone get behind him, couldn't catch up, they lose the game. So, you know, that's you know, you're never going to let one game or even one uh, sorry, one player, one game dictate a grade on a player. But those were things that I started to learn towards the season where he just isn't fast enough and he's not very big and. You know, it seems like he's more of a risk taker than someone that's really calculated with his decision making. So I finished him round four, round five. Um, still a guy that I would take a shot on. I mean, playmaker is a playmaker. And if you can get some more discipline in him and a scheme like this that does preach discipline and, you know, you put him in the right situation, I think the guy can play. By no means is he a cast off. You know, he didn't get like an undrafted grade for me. He's still, he's my 10th graded safety in the class. Mm. So it's still a guy that I would very strongly consider on day three. That's Cameron Kitchens from the University of Miami. Any uh, any thoughts on James Williams, his teammate, who was about like six foot eight? <laughs> six foot eight. Did that did that not remind me uh, of Cam Chancellor? Uh, just a watching him play football. I mean, just the the size. I'm like, what is this guy doing playing safety? Um, I, I put him with my linebackers, so okay. um, I, I don't have him graded with my safeties. The greatest of safety was was pretty late, um, six seven, and linebackers. He was up in the I think the three four range. So I like him as a football player, enforcer, big time. You know, you go from subpar athlete at safety to almost an elite athlete at linebacker, mm -hmm. and he already has the size. He doesn't weigh 215. He's a 230 plus, former five-star recruit, really tough upbringing, uh, really unfortunate story how he grew up. And to see him come out on the other side like this, I, I like that. I get into that stuff when I really kind of read and dig deep about some of the background stories because I do think – uh, that means a lot at the next level, you know, who these guys are as people and how hard they're going to work and how much they appreciate opportunity. And James Williams, he's undisciplined on the field. I think I, I think I had nine personal foul penalties on him over his career, face masks, late hits, all this stuff. But he is a guy that will change your defense personality wise. He, he will scare dudes over the middle. And at that size, you know, one, one of the growing trends in the NFL are these slot tight ends that, you know, your mm -hmm. are Brock Bowers, your Travis Kelsey, your former Darren Waller, obviously, right? These guys that, who do you put on them? You know, what, what do you even do with these guys? You can't put a DB on them. You can't put a linebacker on them. And James Williams is that hybrid that I think a lot of teams are going to want. So I, I think he could be a top 100, sneaky top 100 pick. What's going on, Big Blue Banter listeners? I'm excited for the football season for several reasons. And one of those reasons is Prize Picks, which is North America's largest independently owned daily fantasy sports platform. And it's so simple to use. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including professionals, sharks, and people who are going to exploit you, you pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections, and you just watch the winnings roll in. It's very simple to play and gives you a little extra skin. I set my picks in less than 60 seconds. There are so many stats to choose from, and the withdrawals of funds are easy and quick. 
Dan and I will be adding a segment to our show before every game where we pick our favorite stats, more or less yards or touchdowns, what have you, and we'll be discussing why from a scheme, matchup, and game theory perspective. I love their promotions and how easy their interface is to operate at prize picks. I may select more on tackles for a loss from Bobby Okereke or Kayvon Thibodeau next game. They also do other sports as well. It's a really cool experience. Please join Dan and I in the fun of prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. You will not regret it. You ever feel sluggish or out of focus? Are you stressed? Has your digestive system caused discomfort or flatulence like a certain co-host on this podcast during a live stream? If so, you should check out AG1. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my daily health. I had more energy, I was better off at the gym, and I could focus on my work in a much more efficient manner. That's because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. Not only did I replace my multivitamin with AG1, but I love that every scoop also includes prebiotics, probiotics, and digestive enzymes for gut support. I recommend AG1 to all my family and friends because AG1 has a team of doctors and scientists that formulate around the latest science and maintains high quality standards within the industry. Even my friends have started drinking AG1, and they always tell me how energetic they feel and how it's helped them out at the gym, and also it's helped them manage their stress levels. That's why we're happy to have AG1 as our partner. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3, K2, and five free AG1 travel packs when you first subscribe. Go to drinkag1.com slash banter. That's drinkag1.com slash banter to check it out. Our mental and physical well-being is of the utmost importance. Whether you're a world-class athlete or a podcaster like me, we all need to take that very seriously. That's why I'm excited that Unified Healing is sponsoring this episode of the Big Blue Banter podcast. Unified Healing is a new and super innovative global network of wellness centers powered by Energy Enhancement System, or EE System. If you haven't heard of the EE System yet, you'll want to listen up. This technology promotes wellness, deep relaxation, purification, and rejuvenation. Whether you're here in New York, New Jersey, Arizona if you will, or hundreds of other locations across the globe, access to a center is easy and affordable. Interested in experiencing the EE system technology for yourself? Go to unifiedhealing.com slash banter to learn more and find a center near you. That's U-N-I-F-Y-D healing.com slash banter. No material or testimonials on the Unified Healing website are intended to be viewed as medical advice or a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare providers with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment. And before undertaking a new healthcare regimen, include EE system. All right, Ty, before we transition to the offense, we're going to talk a little bit about the linebacker position, but there's a linebacker who the Giants just brought back in Isaiah Simmons. So I have to ask you, is he going to be a linebacker for this team? Do you think he's going to be a sub package linebacker? Or do you think we're going to see some snaps of him at wide nine, which kind of makes some sense given uh, Shane Bowen's defense? That is where I th- I think that's why they brought him back is more. And he was pretty productive in the limited yeah. amount of pass rush snaps that he had last year. That is, I mean, I, I hate to say you give up on a player, but he's been in the league a long time. He's been in different schemes, different roles. We haven't seen him just as a pure edge rusher yet. And I think that's going to w- be where his role is. They might not add to this edge rusher group in this draft because of, you know, Burns, Tibbs, uh, Thibodeau, Ojolari. And now you have Simmons as like that, that package guy. 
So I, I really do believe his speed is still there. His ability to swallow up a lot of space in just a short amount of steps, his ability to play with long arms as he bends, as he turns the edge. I mean, he just has a lot of, he always has had natural pass rusher in him. Um, I think too many defensive minds thought he was just going to be Derwin James part two. Mm -hmm. And they were just putting him into certain roles where he just, he can't hack it instincts wise. He plays really high. He, he's when a blocker gets their hands on him, he's done. So I think that's the main reason why they brought him back was more sub package slash give him some wide nine looks in a room that does need another edge rusher. He might be the answer. Sai, also, what about linebackers? Day three linebackers for the Giants to consider. There's just not a lot of depth there behind yeah. Michael McFadden and Bobby Okereke. Yeah, I have a bunch of day three linebackers. It's amazing how many I do. Um, a guy I love trying to give you a unique, unique, uh, unique name here. Still Chambers from Ohio State. He's more of a late day three pick for me. Former running back as of a couple years ago. And when I watch these Ohio State linebackers, everyone wants to watch Tommy Eichenberg here, who I have a, a day three grade on. I don't think he's going to be a, a round two, round three guy. Um, he's ahead of Chambers, but Chambers stood out to me athletically. And he's got this closing speed that – a lot of teams need at linebacker. It's just a faster position than it was. The average size of the NFL linebacker is smaller than it used to be. Um, how good you are at taking on blocks and defending the inside run, it's still important. It always will be. But these guys got to be comfortable in and, and space. And I, I like Steel Chambers as a guy that is not going to be counted on right away. He's still developing a lot of instincts at linebacker um, after being a former running back that just couldn't get on the field in the Ohio State backfield. And – you know, this is a good spot for him. Let him contribute on special teams. Let him sit for a year or two um, and still get some usage out of him and and see what you have uh, if something happens to Michael McFadden or, you know, God forbid, Bobby Okereke. So J.D. Bertrand from Notre Dame, a smart leader. He was the guy that I think the coaches at the Senior Bowl voted as the top linebacker there in practice. And those, those are things that you should always pay attention to, like those opinions of, of guys that are playing against them in a practice setting and a pro setting like that. He was the guy that was just always around the ball, getting others around the ball, calling out shots. Um, and Michael Barrett from Michigan, undersized, definitely uh, linebacker number two from Michigan. Junior Colson is the top guy there. It might be the top linebacker in this class, but another just kind of fidgety, quick, get underneath, get underneath the pads of blockers, find, find the football and take these guys down when they get their hands on. Those are all day three linebackers that, you know, are going to add something to special teams, but I do think there's something there if something like with Mike McFadden does not work out. Love it, Cy. And before we transition actually to the offense, I want to talk about a position that I think might be a lot higher on the Giants draft board than people realize. And a lot of that has to do with the system they're coming into. Again, we're going to be, it's going to be a change. We're going to be relying a lot more on the front four to get the pressure and then a lot of drop seven. And it's going to be different than what we've seen under Wink Martindale. And that position is interior defensive line. And yeah. I think, what happens in the NFL draft, it used to happen more than it happens now, but it used to be guys drop into round two or three and they're f fantastic values and players, but because they play the interior defensive line, they would drop. And that would happen with linebacker and running back. It's not happening as much lately. I think teams are starting to understand the importance, especially if that player can rush the passer of having a, of having an interior defensive line. Because look, a lot of these quarterbacks deal better with the exterior pressure than the interior pressure. So with that in mind, there are a few names that could be on the board for the Giants at pick 47 that intrigue me. Braden Fisk is a player Nick and I have covered. Chris Jenkins out of Michigan. Um, a few others that have come to mind, but I think those are the two that I've pinpointed on. How about for you? At that pick, you know, 47, is there is it possible the Giants could just be looking at interior defense line being like, look, this is the best guy on my board. We need this. Let's do it. 100%. 100%. I think D-tackle, it should be on the board. Again, what's the identity? What are we trying to do here, guys? Right, right. we brought Brian Burns in. Cool, it's still not good enough. You still need a. I want you want a fourth, maybe even a fifth pass rusher that can really go win one on one. And right now they have three, and you like Ojolari. Maybe he can be that fourth. I do think it's it's obviously it's worth a shot economically, but I want a fifth, and I want a guy that can play inside because I don't want to have to take these guys off the field. Right. Thibodeau and, and Burns and Dexter Lawrence is. We know that we don't need to talk about him. Uh, there are. That I've never had this many th classic three technique technique grades hmm. that can be taken in the first three or four rounds ever. It's almost like I'm just writing the same report after <laughs> every single guy, like unbelievably explosive, a little short, but he kind of uses it to advantage because he's, he plays with great leverage. He has enough power, short arms, which is a deal breaker for some. Um, and there it's just one after the other. And you have to assume that, 
at some point the Giants are going to be on the clock and a good value at that position will be there And it as soon as round two. And I'll give you the number two guy. And this is the last one of who I think might be a surprise first oh. rounder. It's Braden Fisk. Yeah, I, I think I think he is, and it's 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 because of the way the game is going right now. Everyone wants these interior pass rushers. Um, you know, you could see with the contracts that be given out. I mean, if we said seven years ago, look at these defensive tackle contracts that were going to be given out, nobody would believe it. And right. it, it's it's a fact that the the league is valuing these guys even more. Um, so you really do have your pick of guys, and I think Aaron Donald changed the game. And that, that mm -hmm. to me, is the mark of an all-time great. You know, Lawrence Taylor changed the game because of what he did. The average defensive tackle, I think, has gone in the NFL has gone down, I think, 15 pounds since Aaron Donald has come to the league. And it's movement-based, leverage-based, technique-based, versatility. So you ask, you start asking these, yourself, these guys, like, hey, are there any guys that fall in line with Aaron Donald? Let's not go there. The last time I did that, I – I gave Adebore a first round grade who went the fourth round grade to, to the Colts last year. So let's stay away from, from comparisons to all time grades and Aaron Donald, but I'm just going to read off the list of names of guys that I think could be round two, three, four, and just listen to how many it is. Three techniques. That's it. There's other D tackles too, but Byron Murphy from Texas, Jerzon Newton from Illinois, Braden Fisk from Florida state, Michael Hall jr. From Ohio state. That's a guy I like a lot. Chris Jenkins from Michigan, Dwayne Carter from Duke. Brandon Dorless from Oregon is a tweener, but I do think he's a three tech, just not doesn't fit the physical profile of some of the other guys. And then Makai Wingo from LSU. You know, these are guys, and there's even further. I mean, if you want to go further into later day three, you can add, easily add a guy, and you're not going to be reaching at any point. So I'm on board with anyone that thinks D tackle, pass rushing D tackle should be on this on mm. the uh, board at some point. Well, I Absolutely. love how you said there's depth too. So it might be something they can look, like you said earlier, the running back, the value might be waiting till day yes. three. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. I love that you brought up Makai Wingo. That would be like an ideal situation if he were to fall to like the fourth round. When I turned on, I turned on Mason Smith's tape and I fell in love with Makai Wingo. It was one of yep. those types of situations yep. that we were talking about a little bit before. So there's one player at the defensive line position before we transition to the offense. Rook O from Clemson. Now, very raw type player, has not been playing football all that long. Turned on his tape. You could see that he's raw. You could see that he struggles to put a pass rushing plan together, but you can also see that there are building blocks and foundational traits that he does possess that be unlocked. And I look at Andre Patterson and I say, this could be a moldable piece of clay for the Giants to draft. If he were to fall to day three, looks like he's probably going to be a day two pick. So I just want to know what you think of him. My number one defensive tackle. And oh, I don't I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think anyone else has him that high. And my grade on him is more about projection than it is current state. However, with that said, I think he is a Dalvin Tomlinson, no doubt, good player. He has a higher ceiling than Dalvin, much better, much better athlete. He he destroyed the combine and in both his workouts, but also, um, but also just in drills. Like I time and, and grade the drills at the combine too, and he was DT one there. He was DT one in the great, in the, in the workouts size. I mean, a lot of these guys that I just talked about, they have length issues, uh, 32 inch arms, 31 inch arms. I think he was measuring at 34 plus. So this is a guy that, yeah, I mean, look at that, that chart. Like he is. And, and the, the one marker right there is weight. And I feel like to me, the weight is just becoming less and less important uh, with him be, being a shortcoming there. Um, you know, this is uh I'm trying to think I have an actual ranking on him. Um, but he just makes sense from every angle because I also get the opportunity to talk to prospects. And when we interview them, ACC offensive linemen, I always will ask, who's the toughest player? Who's the toughest guy? Not, not even the best. Who's the toughest guy you've had to match up against? This kid came, this kid's name came up more than anybody. And he it's, it's the hands. And what do we always hear defensive line and offensive line coaches talk about? how important, how vital it is to have really strong country hands and that his length combined with that hand strength combined with that workout combined with Clemson had him as a stay at home guy a lot because they had Tyler Davis who was kind of like the, he, he grabbed a lot of the headlines with the sacks and tackles for loss, but he's not nearly the prospect. He's in this class. He's a fifth round grade for me. Um, they just didn't, I don't think he really was let loose in college. And I think this is going to be a classic, much better in the NFL than he was in college type prospect. So I'm all about this guy. I think he'll be a day two. If he's there in round two, there's going to be a very small list of guys I would take over him. Wow. Love it. All right. Let's make that transition now and get to the offensive side of the ball. Because we did talk earlier a little bit about the interior offensive line. I think everybody 
is aware right now that the Giants – I think it just goes back to what you said earlier, Cy, and me and Nick are on the same page. We were just – if it was up to us and we were GM, we'd draft an offensive lineman in every draft class. That's just simply how it would go. And we still, despite the fact that we've invested – because I know you've – have you seen that chart that's that's out on Twitter about how since I, they use like the um, – the draft value chart, essentially what picks are worth and no team has used anywhere near the draft capital on the offensive line as the giants have over like the last three or four draft class, which is crazy. crazy. And we have like the worst <laughs> line in the league somehow, but point being, we don't care. We still want to keep throwing picks at it. And yep. that's just how it goes. So I want to get a little bit, uh, I want to, let's go a little specific here. Let's start with just as it, as it tackles worth discussing too, but I just want to start interior offensive line first. Yeah. I said this to Nick a few podcasts ago, but I just am a little bit underwhelmed by this group. So maybe talk me out of that and discuss maybe if there's players who you think could be available at 47 who are just out of this world values, or if not, maybe 70. I have two tackles that I put into my guard okay. stack based on where. So that makes, if you took those two out and, and I'll give those names and maybe that changes your perception a little bit. But um, if you take those two guys out, it's, it's an, it's an underwhelming, uh, underwhelming, underwhelming group. Sorry. Um, that to me, I still would rather have them than what they have in house right now. Okay, you know, I, I think I'm done with Marcus McKeithen. Uh, I don't think there's anything there with him. So I think that guy's got to be replaced at some point. Um, but Graham Barton from Duke and Jordan Morgan from Arizona are guys that I graded with my guard stack. They, okay. you know, Barton actually has experience inside. Um, he's on record saying he wants to play tackle. I mean, who doesn't? They get paid more. Um, but the Senior Bowl was going to put him at center. And then he had to pull out because of injury. So I think, that, and that's that's a league thing. You know, Jim Nagy from the Senior Bowl, like he will do what the, the scouts and the teams want him to do. So it tells me that he's being viewed as a center or guard. Um, so if you, it, I like both those guys in round two if they're there. Um, Jordan Morgan is a guy. I just said that Rook is, you know, is a very small list of guys that I would take over Rook if uh, he was available in round two. Jordan Morgan's on that list. Um, I like him a lot as a guy. What I think the Giants would really benefit from doing the offensive line is similar to what they did in free agency is you draft a guy that can project to both spots. It is hard for an offensive lineman to develop two spots at once. So I don't want to get in the way of that. Um, but Jordan Morgan was an outstanding tackle and he, he put himself on the radar in 2022. He got a, uh, a first slash second round grade from the advisory board. However, he tore his ACL late in the year. So he went back to school and he played in 2023 wasn't as good, but I always give a guy an offensive lineman a year plus um, after tearing their ACL before I really say, Hey, he has it or he doesn't those. It just takes longer for those guys to recover than a Wandale Robinson who weighs 170 pounds. Of course he can recover and, and make plays really excited about him, by the way, I think the giants have something there. Um, but Jordan Morgan, you put him at guard. And if you know, at this time next year, it's not working for Evan Neal and there's a hole. You at least have an in-house option right away. You don't have to shop hungry as Joe Shane likes to say. And there are a couple of guys, Graham Barton, Troy Faltano, who's not going to be there in round two. I thought he would be, um, you know, there, there are multiple guys that I think can project to both spots. So in met, instead of me just saying interior or just a tackle, there's a list of guys that I think could be someone that you project to both, but Dan, sorry to go off on a tangent there. I do think the guard group is underwhelming, but I do think the center group is really strong. I know. And I think we should open up the door way. to talking about John Michael Schmitz here. Okay, let's do it. And I, I'm not sold. I, I really didn't like what I saw last year. I think he can play. I think he can play, and I'm not going to get – there are a lot of other holes on this team that need to be addressed first, and I don't want him replaced. But I would like to, if I can get one of these centers to come in here and A – create a little competition, create a little depth, and also back up multiple spots. I I might want to swing for that fence in case we know at this time next year, John Michael Schmitz is not taking that step up. I don't hate that yet. Yeah, go ahead. You, you can go down. Oh, okay. No, you go first. I have something to say too, but go ahead. I, right. I want us both to get in here. Yeah, for John Michael Schmitz, it, at Minnesota, his his zone reps were a lot better than his power gap reps. Yep. I think he's, he's somebody who can reach across like an opposite three technique and then seal, get his hips swung around. He was excellent at that. I don't yep. think he was really put into a position to, to thrive last season. They did yep. run zone more than they did in the previous year, but it nothing really manifested around John Michael Schmitz. The guards around him were really bad. They brought in yeah. a veteran and Justin Pugh. He had to be kicked over at left tackle because Azudu got hurt. So I like to give him the benefit of the doubt, but I do look at like JPJ, Jackson 
Powers Johnson from Oregon. Mm. And I was watching Oregon's offensive tape and I was like, oh, he's so much better than John Michael Schmitz. Yeah, I completely agree with what you said. And I said this on a podcast ago. I'm kind of disappointed that we can't get involved in the center cast class, most likely. And yeah, what you said true. is possible. So I, I just don't know if a GM would be willing to invest like a pick 47 after going for John Michael Spitz unless they felt like one of the two could be a guard at the next level and right. felt confidently about that. But I went, I had the same thoughts going through the center class. I was really just, I almost just a, a feeling of disappointment comes over me because I th 